The Bible tells a story of two women that were fighting over one baby. Okay? So they were... One was saying both of them had babies, but one mother laid on her baby and it died. So then that mother took her dead baby, put it over with the other mother, and took the live baby from that mother and kept it. And then when they woke up in the morning, said, this is not my baby. And said the two were fighting over whose baby was the live baby. So how would you solve the problem? Who, who is the real mother? Well, you don't know because they're both fighting over the same baby. So they went to King Solomon. And God gave him the wisdom to know how to settle who was the real mother. And Solomon said, let me have the baby. And then he took a sword and he was going to like kill it. And the real mother said, no, don't kill it, don't kill it. Let the other mother have it. And then he knew who was the real mother because she was willing to give up her baby just so it would live. Okay? We need God's wisdom to know what's true, right? And there's only one place that that wisdom comes from, and that's God. Right? So when we have a dilemma, when we have a problem, we need to go to God to help us. Okay? Mm -hmm. Okay, you can take your seats. Salvation is not an afterthought with God. 1 Peter 1.20 says, He was chosen before the creation of the world, but was revealed in these last times for your sake. We give systematically and regularly because that's the divine model that was demonstrated that his giving to humanity was not an afterthought. The plan to offer his son and rescue humanity from sin was elaborated before the creation of the universe. And at the set time, Jesus came to planet Earth. This clearly illustrates the consideration of a loving God for fallen humanity. In response to the example set by the greatest giver, the Apostle Paul gave the following admonition to the believers in Corinth. On the first day of every week, each one should lay aside a sum of money in keeping with the income and saving it up, giving that is planned on. Our scripture reading is from Matthew 25, 2, which says, And five of them were wise, and five were foolish. So as I begin this morning, Let's open with prayer. Loving Father, we ask that you would help us to be the wise ones, to follow you all the way. We ask, Father, that you would bless our time together as we open your word, and that you would speak to our hearts as only you can. For we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Brother Olagi, if you would like this, I've got a Spanish one for you. I don't know if you or Margarita, whichever. I only have one, unfortunately. Maybe you could make one for one. Uh, I'd like you to look at the first verse. I'm just going to go verses 1 through 13, one by one, okay? 
It says, Then the kingdom of heaven shall be likened to ten virgins who took their lamps and went out to meet the bridegroom. This verse is talking about the end of time. As we learned in, or have seen in chapter 24, it's talking about the end of time. And I'd like you to look at the word virgins too, because virgins represent those that know the truth and there's no false doctrine in their understanding. So they're virgins in the sense that they're teaching only biblical truth and, learn, and, and believing it. They didn't deviate from that truth that Jesus taught. <clears throat> Verse 2. Now five of them were wise and five of them were foolish. So what is the difference between the wise and the foolish? This is something that we need to key in on. Why were some wise? Why were some foolish? It depends on what they're doing with their time. So time is of the importance. If somebody loves you, will they spend time with you? And if they don't really love you, then they're going to pay attention to you for a little bit but not as much as somebody that really loves you. I think the best illustration I have of that is when I was teaching in Hobbes, I asked the kids what happened over the Christmas break. And I got them to write a little essay, if you will, about what happened over their Christmas break. And one broke my heart, and that was Susie, who said, my parents gave me all kinds of things, but neither of them were home for that whole two weeks, basically. I had some great toys, some great things that they gave me, but they spent out of two weeks less than one day with us, my, myself and my brother. So I want to submit to you this morning that if you really love Jesus, you're going to spend time with him. And that's the difference between the wise and the foolish in this story which Jesus told. Okay? The wise made extra preparation, spent extra time, so that they would be prepared for what was about to take place, whereas the foolish spent little time, only the minimum necessary. Verse 3. Those who were foolish took their lamps, but took no oil. The oil represents the Holy Spirit. I think most of you know that. But what here it says, that they took no oil with them. Meaning what? That they didn't spend any time asking the Holy Spirit to come into their lives daily. And therefore, they weren't ready, they weren't prepared for what was about to take place, and that is Jesus coming. Now, all, even though this is only a parable, it still tells us a lot about the end of time. They had not asked for the Holy Spirit to come in and take charge of their life. But the wise took oil in their vessels with their lamps. They asked for the Holy Spirit to come in and fill them each and every day. Verse 5 says, And while the bridegroom was delayed, they all slumbered and slept. So it says they all slumbered. They were not as alert as they needed to be to the signs of Jesus' coming in this parable. 
You might say the foolish were sleeping soundly where the wise were nodding off from time to time. Okay, they knew Jesus was coming, but they weren't always as alert as they should have been. And 6 says, And at midnight a cry was heard, Behold, the bridegroom is coming. Go out to meet him. The cry from the church, Jesus is coming, and get ready. We've all heard it. For how many years? All of our lives, probably. You know, I never thought I would get out of uh, college before Jesus came. Then I thought, surely by 2000, Jesus would be here. And now I'm looking at retirement and I'm saying, he's not here yet? But we see things happening in the world today that tells us that we're getting closer than we were before. All the time, we're getting closer. We see the wars, we see all the conflict, we see the the natural disasters, and we say, he's coming soon. You know, one of my elders in Hobbes, he keeps telling me, well, how much longer do we have to wait? I mean, it's, it's terrible. I said, well, it's not quite like Sodom and Gomorrah. Not quite. It's close, but not quite. We see the disasters happening. We see the wars happening. And we see how much worse can it get but as I read Matthew 24, it's going to get worse. A lot worse. So we wonder, how long? And it says, in verse 7, Then all those virgins arose, trimmed their lamps, and the foolish said to the wise, Give us some of your oil, for our lamps are going out. But the wise answered, saying, No less... There should not be enough for us and you, but go rather to those who sell and buy for yourselves. Can we give the Holy Spirit to others? No. It's each one of us have to have that personal experience, right? You can't go out and get it. You can't be prepared for the disaster when it comes. You have to prepare ahead of time, right? There's no preparing at the last minute. Each person has to have their own relationship with God. Verse 10 says, And while they went to buy, the bridegroom came, and those who were ready went in with him to the wedding, and the door was shut. You can't prepare when the disaster is here. You can't prepare for Jesus when he's already here. It's too late. And afterwards, the other virgins came also saying, Lord, Lord, open to us. The clear word puts it this way about the foolish. You never accepted me as your personal savior. Or, another way of putting it is, you never took time for me, so I can't claim you now as my friend. I like the way it puts it here, because it gives us another understanding that they weren't taking time. The foolish were not taking the time. They were not asking for the Holy Spirit to come in and fill them. I liken that to some of the people in our churches. They come, they believe the message, but they're not taking their own personal time with Jesus. They're not spending time in his word. They didn't take time for Jesus, so he can't claim them as his own. This passage always bothered me. Because it says they're virgins, they believe the message but they're not taking the time with Jesus. They're not asking for the Holy Spirit to fill them day by day. 
the good Christians. You might even say the good Seventh-day Adventist Christians. They come, they talk the talk, they walk somewhat as they should, but they're not spending the time as they should. And he answered and said to them, Assuredly, I say to you, I do not know you. Why? Because they weren't spending the time. Each day. Watch therefore, for you do not know neither the day nor the hour in which the Son of Man is coming. During the end times, we need to stay alert, work, watch, and wait, and spend the extra time with Jesus each day so that we know how to deal with what situation comes our way. And just like Solomon, he knew what God wanted. When he asked for wisdom to discern the situation with the two mothers arguing over the baby, he knew what to do to determine who was the real mother. Put a sword to the live baby. Then he knew. Some of us need that kind of wisdom. Amen? The wise virgin had the extra oil, which is the baptism of the Holy Spirit. And because of that, they're not in a Laodicean condition. They have an experiential walk with God. And they're ready for earth's last day events. The baptism of the Holy Spirit allows God's law to be written in their hearts. 2 Corinthians 3.3 says, Not on tablets of stone that he wants to write his law, but on tables of flesh, and that is of the heart. They obey God from the heart, which means that God has placed it within their heart to obey. It's a heartfelt thing, a heart motivation, if you will. The wise virgins do not obey God's law only because it says to obey, but they do it because of their love for Jesus. The, the foolish Obey because that's what the Bible says, but not because it's heartfelt. And that's the difference between the wise and the foolish. The wise truly desire to obey God in their heart. Ellen White describes this obedience from the heart in a, in a way. This is from The Desire of Ages, page 668. And it says, all true obedience comes from the heart. It was heart work with Christ. And if we consent, he will so identify himself with our thoughts and aims, so blend our hearts and minds into conformity to his will, that when obeying him, we shall be but carrying out our own impulses. The will refined and sanctified will find its highest delight in doing his service. Highest delight in doing his service. We know God as it we know God as it is our privilege to know him. Our life will be a life of continual obedience. And through an appreciation of the character of Christ, through communion with God, sin will become hateful to us. I want you to notice Obedience comes from the heart. It's not something outward. It's in the heart. When obeying him, we are but carrying out our own impulses. And that, that of continual obedience. The Laodicean Christian comes out of their condition and become wise virgins, letting Jesus into their lives totally and completely. Galatians 2.20 says, when obeying, I'm sorry, Galatians 2.20, 
I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. In every Christian's life, there's before I met Christ and there's after I met Christ. Or after I died to self, if you will. B.C. and A.D. Okay? Before Christ, what was in the heart? Selfishness. But after we die to self, then Christ lives in us. And we're different because of everything we do is different. And anybody can see it. We're free from the grip of self-centeredness. <coughs> I want you to think of the story that I told to the young people this morning. Because that illustrates, again, the out of Christ and the in Christ. What was it that the mother who killed her child wanted? She wanted the other baby. That's the self-centeredness. And she didn't care if that baby was killed even, so long as the rightful mother didn't have the baby. And then you have the rightful mother who said, I'll give up the baby to someone else. That's the kind of God love. Just so that the baby lives. So you have the selfishness on one side and you have the love of Christ on the other. No one ought to miss out on the best that Jesus has to offer. The best is to enjoy him by living with him in charge of your life. And that's what Jesus meant when he said here in John 10.10, 10, the thief does not come except to steal, kill, and destroy. So I want you to think about it. With Solomon's story of the two mothers, the one wanted to steal. Even though she killed her own, she said, I'll kill the other one too, so that neither have it. That's the way the, deal, the devil is. But I want you to think of something else, because this verse says it. I come, he's come to steal, kill, and destroy. So what does he want to steal? He wants to steal your time from God. He wants to steal your time so that you can't communicate with God. So you don't have the time. And what will he do? He will bring up anything and everything to keep you out of God's word. Are you hearing me this morning? Anything and everything. Because his ultimate aim is to destroy. We see that with disease. We see that with our time. The devil has used this in a big way to steal the time from our youth. I know each one of you get a reading once a week that tells you how much time you've spent per day on this device. Is that right? I get it. So I believe everybody here gets it too. It tells you how much time you spent on it this week. So I would challenge you, and I would challenge our youth in particular, but it's not just youth, because I know everybody has the same thing. How much time do you spend on it instead of in God's word, of talking to him. I'm trying to make this point because you know this story of the five wise and the five foolish very well. And I'm bringing it up this morning because I want you to see that the devil is trying to take your time away from God so you don't have that connection you need for the coming end when Jesus comes in the clouds. Are you hearing me? I'm not getting many answers this morning, but anyway. I want you to see, though, that the devil is working hard to steal our time, to kill your relationship with God, 
so that in the end you're destroyed forever. Jesus says, I have come that they may have life and they may have it more abundantly. That's what God wants for us. We live in a fast-paced world with all kinds of things happening to keep our focus off Jesus and of heaven. If you want heaven, you have to work for it. Now, I heard a story on the way over this morning that a man and his wife decided that they wanted to pay their house off early. So he set a goal of three years to pay the house off. They paid the car off. They paid all of their other debts off. They wanted to pay the house off. So he said, if now that we don't have the car payment, we don't have any other payments, we can apply our money just to the house. So when one morning he decided he would pray and ask God to help him with that. And God impressed him, pay not 10% tithe, but 30%, your age. So how can I do that and then pay the house off? That'll take us out 10 years at least. But the impression was that he needed to pay the extra in tithe and offerings to God. And he did it. But then he was surprised because he paid off the house in 10 months. He says, I put pencil and paper because that's my job. And he says, it doesn't work out. I don't know how it happened. But God impressed him to pay the 30%. And then God blessed him with the house being paid for in 10 months. I don't know how that worked. I was listening closely to hear if he would tell me how it worked, but he says, I put pencil to paper and it didn't work. But God blessed. And I know he can do that because he's in charge of all the monies of the world. He's in charge of everything. Satan has come to steal our time away from God. I'd like to look at John 1.1, 1, 1, and it says, In the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, and the Word was God. So as I'm reading his Word, Jesus is speaking to me. This is him speaking to me. Amen? And as he speaks, miraculous things can happen. Most of us plan to be ready when Jesus comes. Amen? But it takes planning to make that happen. If I don't get up in time, if the phone rings, if this happens, if that happens, then all bets are off. I don't think I'm the only one, you know, because I've had many mornings where I plan to spend an hour here or more studying, and then the phone rings, and I'm called to the hospital, I'm called to this emergency or the other. I had it happen this week with one of my elders. The wife called me and said, you need to come over here. I want you to watch and look at my husband. So I didn't spend the normal time that I would have, and sure enough, her husband was having serious problems. And I, I think I know why, but anyway, she was not sure whether he was having a stroke or what because he was slurring and, and not staying awake and different things. And it took him two days to get over it. I think I know what it was, but I went in and saw his arm all swollen. He couldn't move it, couldn't use it. I said, that acts, that's like a stroke. Come to find out it wasn't. It was just he was tired. That arm had kept him awake all night and he couldn't stay awake. And as a consequence, his words weren't forming and other things weren't happening. So, I'm telling you, the devil's busy to try to steal your time. And it doesn't happen just to me, I know. 
happens to each one of us. The devil is busy trying to take our time away from us. But this is what I'm trying to prevent. Verse 12. Jesus answered and said, Assuredly, I say to you, I do not know you. The clear word puts it, You never accepted me as your personal Savior or took time, so I can't claim you as my friend now. Second Corinthians 4.4 4 says, why? Because our minds, whose minds the gods of this age has blinded. I fear too many people, their eyes have been blinded. So why did the five foolish lose out? Their focus was not on being with the groom, Jesus. And because of their lack of the infilling of the Holy Spirit, daily God's law was not being written on their hearts. So their obedience was only formal. They came and sat in the church. You wouldn't know them from any other Adventist. Because <coughs> they came every Sabbath. They talked the right talk. They wanted to be with us. They wanted to associate with us, but their heart was not in it. They lost out because their, their heart was not there. They had a formal and an intellectual obedience, but it was not a heart obedience. These foolish virgins represent those who regard for the truth. They advocate for the truth. They're attracted to those who preach and teach the truth, but they've not yielded themselves to God or his Holy Spirit. They are content with a superficial work, experiencing the Holy Spirit as absolutely essential if we want to go to heaven. Amen? I'd like to talk a little bit about wisdom, too. Wisdom is the ability to think from cause to effect, and it applies to all of our circumstances. Having the Ability to judge right from wrong. What is the best solution? When Solomon did, had that, he decided whose mother was the real baby's mother. Wisdom is associated with knowledge. It's like saving for an emergency financially. You're ready, you're prepared for whatever may happen. Deny yourself whatever pleasure you can so you're blessed for tomorrow. The foolish spend all of their surplus, like funds, on things that don't matter. You know, Mickey D has the famous saying, you deserve a break today. Spend it all now. Don't save anything for the future. The average American watches 28 hours of TV a week. So if you divide that by seven, that's four hours a day. I would dare say with the, with the cell phone now and videos, TikTok and the rest of it, that that might be even increased with our youth. But it can happen to anybody because those things pop up on the screen all the time. I've caught myself doing it more than I wanted, more than I intended, but it happened anyway. With Facebook and YouTube and video games and TikTok, it's a lot of time stolen. Others are addicted to adrenaline. They want the rush of doing something exciting. And I understand that one too. And there's others that are trying to work their own salvation. Wisdom makes one good at developing a strategy to go to heaven. So what is your strategy to go to heaven? That's what I want to impress upon you this morning. 
What's your strategy? Are you spending the time that it takes to go to heaven? Because if you're not spending the time, then that's probably not the right strategy. You need to have a strategy, and that means T-I-M-E, time. That's what it takes to develop relationships. And the best one we need is the one with Jesus. If I really want to go to heaven, then I need to work on my relationship with God. Amen? Because if you don't work on that relationship, if you're not talking with him, if you're not communing with him, let him talking to you, then it's just not going to happen. You know, I helped a lady this past week. And I said, you know, you don't have water in the house. You don't have electric in the house. And you can't work anymore because you're disabled. So how do you plan to get better? I said, you need to move into public housing where you have air conditioning because you've been in the hospital twice no, three times this past week into the ER because of your health and because of the heat. It was 108 that week. So what are you doing? What's the strategy? Well, I hope that things will get better. I said, hoping doesn't work. You have to have a strategy to make it happen. Amen? And if we don't have a strategy to be in heaven then it's not going to happen by happenstance. Are you hearing me? Happenstance won't make it. You have to plan on it, you have to strategize, and you have to take the time to make sure that it will happen. <laughs> Walking with Jesus is a lifetime experience. And I want to close with this one from Philippians 1.6. Being confident of this very thing, that he who has begun a good work in you will complete it to the day of Jesus. But my point is this. You have to ask him to come in and take over each and every day. How many want to ask him to come in and take over each and every day? Amen. Let's bow our heads for prayer. Loving Father, we thank you. For your many blessings, we ask, Father, that you would be with each one. Help us this day and every day to prepare to meet you in the clouds when you come. Help us to strategize each day to make that happen. And to you be the honor and the glory for this day and every day. In Jesus' name, amen.